Um, next up, we have Reynold Schweikart, Senior Advisor, Lincoln Network, uh, on accelerating innovation in the legislative branch. Thank you, Reynold. Thank you, Ginger. Let me see if I can share the screen here. Um, so thank you for having me today. Uh, my talk is entitled Accelerating Innovation because there's a lot of innovation and people working both inside the legislative branch. Um, give a shout out to Kirsten Gullickson at the clerk's office and Lisa LaPlante at um, GPO as two key inside players. And then on the outside, um, Daniel Schumann and Zach Graves working to influence uh, Congress from um, the outside. So um, one of the things I wanna point out is um, there's a lot of great technology. Congress operates a little bit differently sometimes, so it's hard to take off the shelf technology and inject it into um, the House or the Senate but um, there's a set of issues around um, policies that are in place, uh, funding, uh, staff expertise, particularly given staff turnover um, in areas where the House and Senate need to coordinate how to herd those cats uh, to get that coordination. And there's some areas such as legislative drafting where the ownership of that space is pretty diffuse between appropriators and the oversight committee, between the Senate secretary and the house clerk, the legislative councils, the government publishing office, the library of Congress, the congressional budget office. And so um, organizing all of those interests and um, perspectives to make meaningful change uh, is a very complex uh, process. So, things that I'd like people to think about in this space is, you know, what are we doing right? And there's a lot that's being done right, but are we using all of the tools in the toolbox? Are we using all the levers? Um, and to paraphrase um, James Carville, um, it's about the members, stupid. So on the external game of creating transparency and accountability, um, that's less true. But if we're talking about getting innovation taken up inside Congress, you know, we need to think about it through the lens um, of the individual members. And so how does that innovation meet their needs so that it gets valued and it gets implemented and staff can effectively use it? Um, part of that question is who helps and who delays innovation in the legislative branch? And of course, um, how does it get paid for? So one of the successes I'd like to highlight and talk about tweaking just a little bit is some work that uh, Samantha McDonald did with PopVox, created a represent, statistically representative group of constituents to discuss a policy issue with um, a member of Congress. There were a couple of um, things that she noted as needs improvement. And I think my perspective on that is how do you increase the perception and reality among the constituents that their time and their input was valued? And I think looking at this kind of a pilot where you have a member that says, I'm gonna work on issue X, I'm gonna gather a group of constituents together, we're gonna to talk about it for a week. And at the end, here's what, how you made a difference. I am now introducing, you know, HR 1234, that's gonna address this issue. And it also enables them to leverage the time that they spend by communicating more broadly um, with the district. And one of the problems or one of the challenges with these pilots is once you've got a formula, how do you move it 
from a single member you know, to a broader uh, community of members so that it actually makes a difference in the institution. Um, related thought, this is not directly following, but um, for staff, how do we make the tools that they're using for innovation um, part of a toolkit as opposed to a jam desk drawer with a bunch of uh, you know, screwdrivers and wrenches in it. Um, one of the interesting things that the house is working on is to create an enterprise constituent management system that's envisioned to have an open framework um, so that different actors, outside groups, party organizations, vendors can add functionality. So you can have a place where all of the little tools get organized and kept instead of um, bunches of little scripts um, that uh, get forgotten. And then the second thing is once you have tools, how do you get people to use them effectively? So people like Lorelai, Kelly and others are talking about how do you create playbooks to guide staff through um, activities and finally using user-centered design, you know, create tools that are that people are going to want to use, know how to use, and don't have to go look in the 200 page manual every time they think about um, using them. So let's talk about sort of barriers to innovation for a second. Um, you know, staff turnover. Um, so techniques don't get passed down, people are too busy, short tenure, if you think about the generations of communications directors or legislative directors that take place in 10 years in many offices, um, you end up with 10 or 20 generations. It's pretty easy for good ideas to get lost. Um, I, I spoke earlier about all of the offices that are engaged in um, the supply chain for the legislative process and uh, hopefully listed them all there. Um, the ability of particularly the CMS vendors, which is Hill Speak for CRM, uh, to fund innovation given the small population of offices um, and how to get internal funding uh, to the right place. And then a big barrier to bringing um, off the shelf technology onto the Hill has been the meeting the cybersecurity and privacy requirements. And I would add the separation of powers issues sometimes with executive branch technology um, so that it can be authorized for use um, on the Hill. And sometimes too much of a project management focus that doesn't think its way through um, the desired behavioral end state in offices. Um, sometimes produces things that are interesting, um, but we haven't actually figured out how to get them into use. Um, so we've got some people um, that are very good at pushing innovation from the outside. Um, you know, particularly, I think, uh, the Lincoln Network and demand progress in the organized communication with um, the Modernization Committee and the appropriators. Um, members are competitive, so sometimes getting them to participate in efforts where they're gonna be awarded or recognized. Um, the party organizations, the GOP conference and the Democratic caucus um, can define goals or set um, some expectations or targets for, for members. Um, obviously, the vendors have a role in improvements. And then the Senate and the House officers that run the technology shops can also define um, minimum functionality that those vendors are supposed to um, deliver uh, the funding of specific projects. And an interesting new effort from the chief administrative officer is to get a, a coaching office to help chiefs of staff um, by bringing sort of existing knowledge to them when they're trying to solve a problem. And then can we work through some of the staff organizations um, 
for chiefs of staff for press comms. Um, as you probably know, staff assistants turn over a lot. So there's this very active listserv where it's like, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, where there can be some opportunities to um, inject some innovation. Um, and money, money, money. So I think that enterprise solutions can be more uh, effective and, imp and impactful. Um, so the current, there's current efforts from the CAO to move spending from individual MRAs, members representational allowances into the CAO's budget by um, providing uh, laptops instead of members buying them, which also allows for some better centralization on uh, security and, and maintenance. Um, and then the enterprise uh, CMS, both of those are efforts have been funded out of the MRAs traditionally. And so as the legislative um, bill is being funded, I encourage people to talk to appropriators about thinking about those things that indirectly um, get relieve pressure on the MRA and to provide more central funding um, to continue um, those kind of efforts. And the appropriators have been good about generally providing um, multi-year funding or no year money for technology projects so that you can plan um, for that initiative. Um, but there's probably a little room to make that practice um, a little bit more widespread. Um, one of the challenges is um, with a lack of funding and too many projects is things don't get done that people wanna get done. And so this is, you know, in the before slide, you don't have enough money. Everyone comes to uh, house officers with uh, desired projects. Nobody gets told no. There's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not enough people get told no. So you get a whole bunch of projects underway without meaningful progress. The sponsor um, finds other alternatives or moves on. Um, the project finally gets done and not enough people care and that cycle continues. So the current CAO is working on um, providing more focus to projects, which is good. The CAO is tending to work in administrative space. So not necessarily producing things relevant to transparency. Um, but that accelerates or intensifies the problem of getting new projects started. So it's to be clear, I think it's good that they're focusing on results, but it also means that um, good ideas don't immediately get um, taken up. Um, the other space in um, Congress for innovation is committees, and there's a there's sort of good news, bad news. So structurally, it's not necessary, it's difficult to figure out whose job it is to help committees um, fund innovation. Um, so the clerk has historically not gotten involved in the internal operation of committees beyond um, a set of things that are required in in-house rules. The CAO um, sometimes thinks that innovation is outside their scope. Um, you know, the good news about committees is they can be laboratories for innovation, but that tends to be personality driven. Um, people remember Chairman Issa at, at um, government reform, he had a lot of ideas or a lot of innovations, um, but they didn't necessarily you know, spread through the house. In the last six or eight years, I think the most interesting thing in committees has been um, docs.house.gov to pull committee documents out of internal files or out of disparate um, processes to make public. Um, and that was effective because it was mandated in house rules and had strong support um, from the speaker and minority leader to apply to all committees. Um, and so we should be thinking about in the next Congress, are there other opportunities for shared or enterprise services that house 
a House rule change in the beginning of the next Congress um, could enable. Reynold, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay, good, good. We're wrapping it up. I'm just very yeah, worried about I'm, time right now. We're over time. Absolutely. So uh, with that, I'd be uh, interested in hearing from anybody with ideas or thoughts and thank you for your time today. And let me turn this back to you, Ginger. Thank you so much. Um,